Oh, he's already done the red button. Good evening, everybody. How are we all? Awesome. Glad you braved the weather, the traffic down the M1. Good to be here tonight. Shane's got a, got a word for us tonight. It's a new message, I understand. Debuting it all for you. So we're going to have a good time. So let's just pray and we'll uh, have a bit of time of praise and worship. Lord, we just thank you right now for your presence in this place, Father. Lord, we hand this evening over to you that you will have your way, Lord. Lord, I thank you we use Shane just to deliver a word that is it's just here for each and every one of us, Father. This is your house, so Lord, we thank you for that open heaven over this place. You will be glorified. This is your house, not ours, Father, your house. We come to praise, to worship your holy name. So Lord, we thank you right now. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen.
On my knees I bow down Sing about the healer And the hope I found You took my tears Took my shame Wash them all away Your love shines down On this heart of mine Lead me to the waters Of eternal life I once was lost But now I'm found It's a brand new day
set the captives free, a word that would just bring life and light and increase. And as so often we heard, Lord, it will be in the disposition of Messiah, which is that amazing love. And we give you praise, Father. We give you praise, Lord Jesus. We give you praise, Holy Spirit, for your wonderful, wonderful sense of your presence. And thank you, Lord. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Just greet somebody, love on them a little, and uh, we're going to go ahead and receive the offering straight away, and we're going to chain up to preach. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, lovely to have you out on this Wednesday night. And um, I want to thank you all for coming, being with us and loving us. And joining together with us. Oh, we're going to have a wonderful time. We've had a great time over Sunday morning and evening. I'm, and I'm speaking to you like this to give you a chance. We're going to receive the offering for Shane and his ministry right now. Um, that allows him to, to minister. And then to remember when, when um, you finish, his teams comes from a long way. So... Well, Shane will talk about buying and thinking and talking and what have you. But if you want to just go ahead and get your offering ready and we'll, we'll receive that for you. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Yeah, awesome. the, the offering, everything, that's it. Thanks, guys. Everything that comes in goes into his ministry. Um, and nothing for us as a church. And yeah, It's just so good to see people. It's lovely to have uh, Pastor Paul and Tracy here with the girls and and more girls. <laughs> For those who remember, they're sitting on the right. Don't forget to say hi to them and Pastor John Owens. Thanks, Mike. 
And Pastor John Owens visiting from Brisbane to be with us. Hi. Ah, thanks, Mike. Okay. In case anybody else doesn't feel welcome, say hi, Mike. <laughs> yeah, we can have fun in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 We want to pray over that offering for you. Because every seed sown will go to him. Every dollar sown. And we will begin to be- we'll believe for supernatural harvest for you. Amen. And then, Shane, why don't you make yourself to platform us? You know, most of you come. A lot of our congregation have had it. We've, Shane has been coming to us for 12 years now. And uh, it's been such a privilege having him. And a lot of you know his ministry for a long time. Just stretch your hands out to the offering. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sow into the, the kingdom of God, into this man's ministry. We thank you, Lord, that it's going to produce a harvest for our sowers, the people of blessing, but also that he will use it for the extension of your kingdom. And we give you praise for it now in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Shame. Good evening. Sorry. So good to be back with you. Um, As always, um, it's an honor to be here. I just count these guys as my friends and can't wait to be here next year on Super Bowl week. That's just what we do. And uh, it's going to be fun. Um, As always, our stuff is uh, set up out there. Uh, the profit from that helps us feed mentally handicapped children in China. It's a good thing to do, uh, to come by and grab something that will change the way you look at God forever, and in so doing, you help us feed, clothes, shelter, mentally handicapped children in China. It's a pretty good deal, all right? So um, the thing is, is that uh, tonight's my last night here. And let me just tell you my schedule. I've got to drive back tonight, and then I've got to start with James McPherson at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning in Budrum. All right, so uh, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a task, and we're, he, James is having me do a, uh, um, an all-day intensive um, with his ministerial leadership college, and he's bringing in all the leaders from all of the campuses, and so um, it's a big day, and, um, and so, I, so what that means is, is that um, I don't mind staying here as long as I need to stay here, but if it's not necessary, um, if we could buy first, right, and, and then chat. Right, so because you guys chat, you are the chattingest people, and I, I think that is fantastic. But if we could buy and then chat, that'll help. That'll help me uh, get to where I need to go. It'll also help uh, my team, who will have an hour drive. So just let, let's stay because tonight is we got to pack up afterwards too. So if you could just help us do that, that'd be fantastic. I do have an online mentoring program up and rolling where once a month I'm in an online classroom teaching people to see the Bible like my rabbi taught me. So if you're into that, you know, come, come on in with us. Um, you wouldn't believe this. Well, yeah, you would, because y'all do everything so excellent around here. Um, these videos are turning out really good. So we're going to do it again tonight. Yeah. Now, uh, so if you weren't here uh, the last few nights, uh, uh, we, these are brand new messages. Uh, this, this one tonight I've never done before. So, um, so it, this could really not be good. But we're going to take risks, because normally what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to try it out first. But, um, but here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna re- to record this to video. Now, what that means is that if you have a crying baby, uh, please do not put the baby in the sleeper hold, but just expediently walk the baby out because a crying baby is very difficult to edit out of a video, okay? That's one. If you, uh, if you are demon-possessed, if you could uh, grab somebody and get the demon cast out of you outside, that would be also that'd be very good. And if you feel that the Spirit of the Lord is, is uh, urging you to, to come up here and scream and yell at the altar, I will just go ahead and tell you he's not, okay? All right, so it's not God. No, you're not hearing God there, all right? So, um, so if we could, just, we could handle all that because you guys have been so, so great of, of an audience. I can't wait to uh, talk you through this. If you're the type that likes to follow along in the Bible, we're going to look at the book of Genesis. Um, right, really, really early in the story, Genesis chapter four. Let me um, let me give my man Lee his um, his uh, top and tail moment. All right, because Lee is very, very good at what he does. All right, and he needs a top and tail moment. And if Lee says he needs a top and tail moment, that's what we give. If you're wondering why I'm so dressed up tonight, it's because when you're making all these different videos, it's good to have different clothes on. All right, so <laughs> it's good to have a different look every now and then. All right, so I hope. Yeah, here we go. All right, ready? Here. All right, Genesis chapter four. Genesis chapter four. I want to talk to you tonight about, this is actually a, a harder topic because um, it's going to challenge us with some of our own darknesses. I, I know if, if, um, if you're anything like me, I, I have some, sometimes I struggle with those moments where I find myself caught in a trap where I evaluate the value of my own life or I, val- I evaluate where I'm at in my own life instead of looking on the inside to what the Spirit of Christ is, 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 is instructing me to do. Sometimes I find myself in the trap of evaluating where I am by looking right and looking left and seeing how people are doing around me. And that, that's a very dangerous trap because here's the reason why. It, let, let's just take finances. If you evaluate where you are financially by looking right and looking left, here's the danger with that. There's always going to be someone richer than you. And there's always going to be someone poorer than you. 
If you evaluate how pretty you are by looking right and left, here's the problem with that. There's always going to be someone prettier than you. There's always going to be someone uglier than you. If you evaluate how smart you are by looking right and left, there's, here's the problem with that. There's, there's always someone smarter than you. There's always someone dumber than you. And you know what the problem with that is? Is that if you're not careful, if you get into that habit in life, you can find yourself stuck in the land of Ur. Prettier, smarter, faster, thinner, fatter, dumber, uglier. And when we do that, we find ourselves struggling with ever being content with what God has put in our field right in front of us. And we get caught in a comparison trap. And then before we know it, if we're not careful, envy sets in. And if I understand what the Bible says about envy, it is a very, very dangerous, dangerous thing that we must deal with that in our life or it runs the risk of destroying us. The, the, the Catholic Church years ago came up with the seven deadly sins. And of course, the seven deadly sins were, were predicated with that passage in, in Proverbs that these seven things the Lord hates. And then, of course, the passage in Galatians that talks about a list of things that God's not real happy with in our lives, not because God's just mad, but because God wants us to win at life. And these things keep us from winning. And of course, one of the seven deadly sins is envy. And of course, some of the other ones are gluttony and lust and, and, and pride, things like this, things that, things that God doesn't want in our life because it, it will destroy us. And here's the thing. I know if I've struggled with that at times, and I know if you've struggled with that at times, then I know I'm dealing with something that, that the whole room can find themselves in the middle of. And here's the good news. The good news is that we're not the first people to struggle with this. We are not alone. We are not unique. These are things that are true to most people's life. And you know what? Things that are that ubiquitous to life, normally we can find an awful lot of wisdom about those things in scripture because scripture has a narrative that flows through it. And a lot of things, some things in scriptures are just here and there, but some things in scriptures appear everywhere because literally from the beginning of time, people have struggled with these things. And looking at the scriptures and looking at these narratives and looking at the authenticity of how these ancient, ancient tribal people had to deal with the exact same things that we have to deal with right now. And I guarantee you this, that if the people who lived back then when the world was far worse than it was today, I mean, far worse. Anybody ever tells you, do you believe how bad this world's getting? Are you kidding me? Compared to what? When would you like to go that is better than now? Like if I had a time machine and said, you can go anywhere you want to go as long as it's past, but if you go, you got to stay for six months. When are you going to go? First of all, unless you're a white man, you're not even getting in the door. A white man can get in a time machine and go back anywhere, anywhere, and so everybody be like, hey, welcome. Here's a table for you, right? But if you're a woman, that's not true. Would you rather be a woman today or in 1950? Or in 1850? Or in 1550? Are you kidding me? Would you rather be black today or in 1950 or in 1850 or in 1550? Is God done redeeming race relations? No, he's not. Is it better than it's ever been? You bet it is. Is God done redeeming equal rights for women? No, he's not. But is it better than it's ever been? You bet it is. Would you rather have dental work today <laughs> or in 1950 or in 1850 or in 1550? Would you rather have a colonoscopy today? <laughs> Or in 1950? <laughs> or in 1850? <laughs> oh, Shane, you believe I bet this world's getting? Are you kidding me? Compared to what? This world's getting better and 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 better. And here's why. Because Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn it. Jesus came in the world to save this world. And you know what? And he's doing a really, really good job with it. You are on the winning team. And so here's the thing. Here's the reason I say all that story is this. Is that in the ancient world, when the world was far worse than it is today, I bet if you go back and ask Cain, or if you went back and asked Saul, or if you went back and asked these guys, hey, if we took them in a time machine and showed them how we're living today, they would look at our life today and go, if I only had that, I would never want for anything. But here's the truth. We're living in the most affluent time that has ever existed in the history of planet Earth. And yet, even now, we find ourselves in the comparison and envy trap, looking right and left, wanting what other people have. That kind of thing will destroy our lives. So let's see what the word has to say about this. This is, a, this is a story from Genesis chapter 4. It's very early in the historical arc. Very, very early. And this is what it says. 
And, and Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I've brought forth a man, which is an odd word, actually, because there is a Hebrew word for baby and boy. But for some reason, it says man. L later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And now, now Abel kept the flocks, and Cain worked the soil. So evidently, Cain was some sort of farmer, and Abel, Abel was some sort of herdsman. In the course of time, Cain brought, brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Uh, and Abel also brought an offering, uh, the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, that sounds pretty serious right there. God's saying, listen, whatever's going on in your heart right now, if you don't get this settled, Cain, it's like it's not something that you want to fiddle around with. This thing is crouching at your door, and it wants to eat you alive, but you can, and actually not just can you, you must get control of this thing. It's like the first sit-down talk with, hey, man, you got to get this thing together. You can't play, you can't, you can't flirt too close to that line. Now, a, a couple of observations about this um, sort of an odd pa passage. One, at this time in history, there are no regulations for the offerings. Like, are we supposed to conclude that God prefers meat over vegetables, right? Are we supposed to conclude, you know, God rather have cows than this? And, and of course, I've heard this thing taught since I was a kid that, oh, you know, God, God didn't like Cain's thing because it didn't have blood and God requires blood. Well, that's not true in this case because the truth of it is is that at this time there were no regulations for the offering. How were they supposed to know exactly what God expected? This is before the Bible was written. This is uh, obviously Moses is writing this way later about the stories that were told back then. It's not that, I mean, they're sort of flying in the dark. Are we supposed to conclude that God wants this and not this and he's expecting them to know what to do? There's no way. And the other part of it that's weird is that in Leviticus later when Moses Moses actually writes this stuff down, you find out that vegetables are actually an acceptable offering if you're a farmer, which makes perfect sense. So if vegetables are ultimately an acceptable offering, then why is Cain's offering not accepted and Abel's is? And of course, the answer lies within the history and within the text. In this, in this passage, this is not an offering for sin. They didn't even know what all that, they didn't know how to deal with all that. That was something that came along way, 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 way later. The earliest offering instituted in this culture was something called a teruma offering, which we talked about Sunday morning. This was a first fruits offering, and a first fruits offering does not have to be blood. It just needs to be the first portions of the firstborn of the best of the best of your flock, right? So if you are a, uh, if you're a farmer, it needs to be the first fruit of your crop. If you are a herdsman, it needs to be the first portions of the firstborn of the flock. It doesn't say a spotless animal. That would be a sin offering, and this isn't a sin offering. This is Abel's first fruit offering. Now, where did they give their first fruit offering before there was a priest to give it to? And the answer was their father. Their father was the priest of their home. So what you see in this early ancient story is this early tradition of giving the first portions of what you make back to the, the spiritual covering over your life in order to say, we trust God and we honor God with the first fruits of what we do. So what you see in this passage is not an, a, a, a sin offering gone awry. What you see in this passage is one person has no problem with the generosity it takes to give the first portions of the fat portions of the firstborn while it says Cain only gave some of the fruit of the ground, right? So the issue in this passage is not the type of offering it is. The issue in this passage is the heart attitude of the one giving it. One person has got this thing around generosity that he's okay with. The other person is giving just some of the fruit of the ground. Now this, uh, this does not meet with the Lord's favor. The Lord gives favor to Abel's offering and not to Cain's. But I, I want to show you um, what ends up happening here. Look, look at this. When God confronts Cain... He doesn't confront his offering. He doesn't say, now obviously there was nothing written down about the offerings. He doesn't say, now listen, you did this wrong. There are clear mandates. There are clear regulations about how offerings must be given. And you know them. You should know how to give the offering. That is not what God confronts with Cain. When God confronts Cain, he does not confront his offering, nor does he confront how he gave it. What he confronts is, is he confronts his mood, his attitude. Why is your face downcast? Why are you so angry? 
What, what's going on in your countenance? What's happening inside your heart that I'm seeing manifested on your face? And if you've been in leadership at all, you know the frustration with this sort of thing. When someone's face is telling you one story and their mouth is telling you another, that is frustrating. You say, hey, 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 something's going on here. What's wrong? Nothing. Well, it doesn't look like nothing. And if it is nothing, tell your face it's nothing. Because your face is telling me it is something, right? This is the first one of those kind of talks where God's like, you know what? There's not even that many people around yet. I'm going to have to deal with this. Listen, here's the thing, okay? Here's the thing. Your face and your countenance is telling me that something is going on in your heart and literally that thing going on in your heart is crouching at your door ready to eat you, bro. You need to get this thing sorted out. And it had nothing to do with the specifics of the offering. It had to do with the specifics of the man's heart. Something was going on on the inside that's easy to cover. It's easy to confront how an offering is given. That's easy to do. It is much harder to confront and deal with something going on underneath the surface. So God warns Cain that this attitude will lead to sin and this sin will destroy him. It seems that God is more interested in the postures of our heart that lead to sin rather than individual sin itself. And of course, Cain doesn't heed the thing. Watch what he does. Watch, watch what happens. Now, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and he killed him. Now, a couple of observations about this. One, envy and comparison lead us to violence. There is a very thin line between allowing envy and comparison to settle in our heart and rationalizing violence. I'm talking about people who are otherwise kind, people who are otherwise rational, people who are otherwise seem to be compassionate, the kind of people you'd want to be around. People like that, when they let envy and jealousy and comparison reside in their heart, they are on a fine line to rationalizing violence. This is when you see somebody who's otherwise a nice person suddenly lash out and try to hurt somebody. Suddenly they do this. Suddenly they go, people who would never do this, they go on the internet and write things about someone that would hurt them. People who would otherwise never engage in that activity. And you say, what is going on? Almost always envy, jealousy, comparison, Something like that has gotten in the heart because here's what you find in scripture over and over and over and over again. When envy and jealousy and comparison go unchecked in our heart, it leads us down a road that where we rationalize violence in people that would normally not rationalize violence. It puts it that close. In the earliest story it happened, when we think that someone else has something better, it leads us to envy and violence. And the problem is, is this happens gradually. But sin is crouching at the door to destroy us the whole time. When he finally kills him, that seems to happen suddenly. But what you see in this story is is that Cain did not kill Abel suddenly. The actual act was sudden. Cain was on that road for a very, 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 very long time. See, most of the time when these kind of things hit, we think at the moment that it happened suddenly. But actually, we've been heading down that road with unchecked envy for a very, very, very long time. And here's the truth of it. It's never the intention of your heart that gets you where you want to go in life. It's always the road that you're on. Always. If you get on the M1 heading north with full intention to get to Sydney, you're going to be very surprised at how small Rockhampton actually is. Okay? And you get to Rockhampton and you go, is this Sydney? It should be about Sydney. And they go, Sydney? Sydney's the other direction. And you go, you know what? How is that possible? I intended with all of my heart to get to Sydney on this road. Well, <laughs> the people in Rockhampton to be like, well, bro... Welcome to Rockhampton, home of the cow, but you're heading the wrong way. Why? Because it's never the intention of your heart that gets you where you want to go in life. It's always the road that you choose to get on. And when it comes to envy, it doesn't matter if you intend to be a compassionate person. If we let envy go unchecked in our heart, if we allow us, to, if we allow ourselves to determine our value by looking right and looking left, if we let that thing at the first glance of it, at the first glance of envy, at the first, at the first hint of, I see somebody who has something I think, I, I think my life would be better if I had their life. As soon as that happens, what the scriptures seem to teach us is we had better crush that thing before it eats us alive because it is not something to play with. When we look at someone else's life, here's, what, here's the most simplest way to understand what happened with Cain. He looked at someone else's life and he thought his life was worse because their life was better. 
And anytime that happens, anytime we look at somebody else's life and we want what they have so bad that we convince ourselves that our life is worse if we don't have what they have, we have something crouching at our door and it will destroy us if it goes unchecked. This is true in lots of different stories in the Bible. Um, Envy and violence are just close siblings. If you find yourself lashing out and you would normally not do that, somewhere down in there, there's, there's this rationalization of envy and comparison that we just normally wouldn't do. But you see this happen to a lot of people. Um, Sarah sends Hagar out into the wilderness. So Sarah gets envious that Hagar has, is pregnant before her. And instead of just dealing with it on the inside and instead, of, and instead of dealing with that internal heart problem, she sends Hagar out to the wilderness. Well, hang on a second. In an ancient world, if you send a woman out into the wilderness, what have you just done to her? You have doomed her to prostitution. You have doomed her to to just a not-so-nice life, to being abused. You have doomed her to roaming. This is not good. Envy and violence are very, very, very close siblings. Sarah, who I think would not otherwise have rationalized violence, what you see in that story is she rationalizes violence because she doesn't deal with the envy in her heart. Jacob tricks Esau out of his entire birthright. Why? Because he got envious of his father's favor over Esau. So he rationalized something that in that culture would be very, very, very violent in the name of, of, of what? Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery because of a coat. They get upset that his father favored Joseph more than the rest of them and gave him a coat of many colors, and they don't deal with that envy. And here's what they end up doing. They end up rash- they take him out to kill him, if you remember, but the firstborn talks them into not killing him, but just selling him into slavery. What sort of brothers sell their brother into slavery any time in history, but especially the ancient Near East? Are you kidding me why would they do that otherwise fairly rational people why would that do why would they do that they would do that because they left envy unchecked in their heart Saul an otherwise rational man gets envious of David's favor with the people and ends up a guy a a guy who at one time had offered David all of his land and tax-free living forever and ever and ever suddenly does not check the envy in his soul and before you know it an otherwise fairly rational compassionate smart man ends up trying to skewer another man with a spear why because envy and violence are close siblings. You say, Shane, what are you getting at here? Well, if I haven't been clear, let me get at it very clearly. Envy and violence are close siblings. And if we don't deal with the envy in our heart, if we don't deal with those moments where we look right and left instead of inside at the Spirit of God and, and the field that God has given us, when we look to other people's fields to determine the value of our own field, when we do that, if we leave that thing unchecked, that thing is sin crouching at our door. And it isn't one of these things that will be innocuous to your life. It is something that will eat you alive. You, you will start rationalizing things that you would never think you would. There's a... Um, there's an ancient Jewish parable um, that the, uh, the wisdom teachers and the rabbis told. It didn't make it into the Bible, but it's, it's a pretty cool story about this very thing. It says that there was a king, and the king was having trouble um, with, with the kingdom. And the reason he was having trouble with the kingdom was he had two subjects, and one subject was given to greed, and one subject was given uh, to envy. And so he had an envious subject, and he had a greedy subject. And the way they carried on amongst themselves was actually causing all kinds of discord um, w- within his kingdom. Because you can imagine if one guy was 100% given to envy, and another guy was 100% given to greed, those two guys would never, ever get along. And so there was was a problem of discord and disunity within the kingdom. So the king had had enough. And so what he did was he called the envious man and he called the greedy man into his presence. And the king said, listen, I am tired of the way you two are carrying on. The way you two are carrying on is actually disrupting and bringing disunity and it's destroying our kingdom. And I'm not going to have this. uh, I'm not going to have this anymore. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to sort this out right now. And here's how we're going to sort it out. We're going to sort it out by this. The first one of you that speaks, whoever speaks first is going to get anything from me he asks. Anything he wants. The first one of you to speak is going to get anything he wants. That should settle it up. As long as whatever you ask for, you have to be okay with me giving the other one twice as much. This is what we're going to do. All right, so, so you can get anything you want. But you have to be okay with me giving the other one twice as much. Well, what happened was, was the greedy person immediately decided to be quiet. Because the greedy person rationalized, if I be quiet, then no matter what he says, I'm going to get twice as much which satisfies my greed. Which left the entire onus on the envious man. 
The envious man had, had all the rights, privileges, and everything. He could ask for anything he wants. The problem with being envious is that even if he got anything he wants, so you talk about a guy with endless resources saying, I'll give you anything you want. The problem the envious man was having was, no matter what he asked for, the greedy man's going to get twice as much. So the envious man was in this absolute conundrum. He just didn't know what to do. And so the way the parable goes is that the envious man thought and thought and thought, and finally he came up with something that he could live with on the inside if the greedy man had twice as much. And so the envious man looked at the king and said, please pluck out one of my eyes, which would have left the other man blind. See, envy blinds us to what's right in front of us. He could have had the entire kingdom if he wanted it, but his envy blinded him to that and allowed him to rationalize violence even to his own pain. That is an ancient Jewish parable about, about what envy will do to destroy our lives should it be left unchecked. We cannot leave those things unchecked. So let's define envy. Let's get some working definitions. Here's the problem. If, if I was to say, listen, so you see, because envy and violence are close siblings, and we don't want to live like that, it'll destroy you. You need to deal with the envy in your life. That is a poor sermon. That is a poor sermon. Here's why it's a poor sermon. It's a poor sermon because it fails to give the language to a big thing. There's nothing worse than hearing something you know is true. No one in this room, if I said, we need to deal with the envy, if, if there's any unchecked envy inside of us, we need to deal with that. Nobody would go, I don't think so, Shane. I don't Envy is not that big of a deal. I don't think anybody would say that. The problem is, is that when we leave big things with no language to help us get our head around it, it doesn't do us any good. So let's see if we can walk through that and help us tonight. Envy is, one, desiring some quality, status, power, success, or happiness that another person has. So it's desiring what someone else has in their field. But it has another part to it. Two, it's desiring them to fail or suffer because of it. It transitions from jealousy about the object. Let's say it's a money or a car or a wife or a husband or a, a kid with a certain set of talents or whatever you're envious of. It goes beyond the object of what they have and it goes to resenting them and somehow believing if they suffer, our life will get better. Envy is very dark that way. Envy is very dark that way. Let's say it this way. Envy is not about the object. It is about the person. And, and, and here's the problem. Envy is widespread because it's the easiest to hide and the hardest to admit. Envy is the easiest to hide. It's the hardest to admit. Think about the seven deadly sins. Gluttony, not very, not very easy to hide, right? If you struggle with gluttony, let me just help you with that. Everybody knows, right? And, and it, it, it's also the easiest to admit, especially in white Western culture, right? If someone in white Western culture says, you know what? I eat too much. Everybody, yeah, amen, amen. Yeah, get your, let's get the donuts. That's all right, right? We rationalize that. Even though gluttony is strictly forbidden in Scripture 25 times more than homosexuality. For the church, we don't care if you're a glutton. We're well, just like, well, whatever, right? Glutton, gluttony is, is easy to have out in the open, and it is easy to admit. So uh, pride, easy to admit. No, no one would have a problem admitting, every now and then I think too much of myself. As a matter of fact, if we don't admit that every now and then we think too much of ourselves, we are, in fact, thinking too much of ourselves, right? L l lust, lust, easy to admit, Easy to get out in the open. Why? Because everybody understands it. Like, no one, would say, if, no one would say, I never lust. That's just ridiculous. If someone says, you know what, occasionally I, I, I deal with this problem of lust, everybody would go, yes, I did. welcome to the human race, right? But envy's not like that. If someone with authenticity at your next home group meeting said, you know what, guys, I, I need to get this off my chest. I, 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 I'm just deeply, deeply dealing with an envious heart. Well, that is not easy to admit, and, and nor is it easy to deal with, because everybody in the room would go, oh, man, envy, you're weird. Like, that is just creepy, right? right? Why? Envy has a stigma to it that the others don't. And because envy has a stigma to it that the others don't, we tend to hide envy. And when we hide envy and don't bring it out into the light to deal with it, what ends up happening is it crouches at our door, and ultimately, we start rationalizing violence, and then it destroys our life. It's widespread because it's the easiest to hide and the hardest to admit. It, it, also, it also reveals our darkest side. Envy reveals that part of us that we don't like to admit. You know, it's that part of us. Let, let's just bring it right, right down to, to you, you know, let, let me talk to you ladies for a second. You, you, you remember the girl in high school who was really, really pretty and she developed earlier than you and all the guys sort of went gaga over her, right? Remember that girl? Yes, you, you don't lie. You remember her, right? Everybody remembers her, right? And she got the dates and you were home on Saturday night right? And she was popular and you were sort of frumpy, 
right? And, 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 and over and over and over again, you, you just sort of, you love to hate that girl. You love to hate that girl. And then here's what happens. 25 years after graduation, now you're in your mid-40s, and you happen to run into her at the mall. And she is 60 kilos overweight, and everything's drooped, and uh, her hair's all scraggly, and she's barely out of her pajamas in a grocery store. And something inside of you goes, yes! (laughs) That's dark. It's that part of you that believes that you'll feel a little better about yourself if someone else doesn't have what they have. So- social media is a problem with this. Facebook, Facebook is a cesspool for envy, and here's why. Facebook is voyeurism for people's greatest side. All you ever see on Facebook is people's greatest side. Listen, can I help you with something? If you put your truest, most authentic, darkest side on Facebook, you're insane. What is wrong with you? Please quit doing that. Facebook is meant for you to put the lighter side of life up. So here's what people do on Facebook. They put the picture of the new BMW. They put the picture of date night, not fight night, right? They, 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 on, on Facebook, on Facebook, they put the picture of the kids. How many kids, how many screaming children have you ever seen on Facebook? Never. What do you see on Facebook? The two-year-old playing. The two-year-old saying his first words. The two-year-old taking a step. Everything is so nice and hunky-dory and fairies are flying. Like this is not real life. And so what happens is, is we voyeur at people on Facebook and all we see is their best side and we secretly start wondering, I wonder what my life would be like if I had something that looked that happy. Because your real life looks nothing like their Facebook life. Have we considered that their real life looks nothing like that? They're posting date night. They're not posting the knockdown drag out fight that happened two nights before date night, which is the reason date night is happening. <laughs> They're not doing that. I mean, it goes even crazy. And, and, and the, younger, the younger generation, I, I, it's hard for me to even say that. I'm 40 now. I just turned 40. And so, and so you know, if you're... 20, I could technically be your dad, I guess, but it, which is hard for me to imagine. But, but here's the thing. I've, I've heard young adults actually speak like this. They were jealous of how many likes their photo got that was less than someone else's likes that their photo got, and their photo was better than this dude's photo, but this dude's photo got twice as many likes as this, and they actually talk like this before we know it. We've harbored these kind of things that ultimately, they seem innocuous, but ultimately they destroy us because it is crouching at our door. Because if we don't deal with it, it can destroy us. And and there's so much to it. It's very complicated. There's a comparison trap pecking order. There's physical. Physical pecking order starts at about six, ends about death. About six years old is when you start noticing if someone else is different. Especially in teenage years and even in, the, well, I'm 40 and we still do it. We look around. Guys do this. They won't admit it. They, they, they want to know who's dressing the best, who's got the best sort of muscles and the, 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 the whole look. And women definitely do it. They, they look around at, at dress and body shape and, and, and physical attributes and teeth. And like, it's like, it is just out there. And before we know it, we, we actually draw conclusions about our physical value by looking right and left instead of up and down, instead of like this. And before we know it, that'll, that'll settle inside of us. And, and then it gets really ugly if we actually believe that we'll feel better about ourselves if something bad happened to them. That's where envy takes a dark spot. Um, two, talent and success without considering the price they pay. We look at where someone is and we want, their, we want that. We want some people, this happened to be a couple of times where somebody said, Shane, I'd love to have your life. Really? Really? You would? Really? You'd, you'd love to sleep in your own bed 27 days the whole year? That's what you'd love to do? You, you'd love to live on an airplane? Sometimes people say, Shane, why aren't you married? Really? Who would marry? What, what's my pickup line to a woman? Hey, see you in a year? I mean, what do you do, right? <laughs> right? right? Like, like, now look, I, I love my job, and I, I, I love the grace God put on my life, and I am fully sold out to what I feel like God's called me to do, but that doesn't mean it's without price. It just means I am more than willing to pay the price because the rewards of being in the middle of what God's called me to do is worth it to me, but you have no idea what it costs me to be here. None. You, can, you, can't, you can't look at these guys on TV and go, man, I'd want them. You have no idea what they deal with. You have no 
idea. And so, and so here's the problem. When we look right and left and determine the value of what we're bringing to the earth by looking right and left, before we know it, envy can set in and we start taking pleasure in someone else's pain. We secretly wouldn't mind if they failed. Very dark, very dark. Three, education and social circles. Why, why am I not invited to that table? You know what? That guy is invited to that table with those people and I know I'm smarter than him. And I know if I was there, I'd be adding more to that conversation than he does. Why is that? We do that. Parenting and spouse, we do that. We get caught, people get caught in that trap all the time. Men get caught in the trap of, man, that guy's wife's so much prettier than mine. Women get caught in the trap of, that, that woman's husband makes so much more money than he does. We get caught in that all the time. And sometimes our social situations um, c- c- can do that. We get caught as, as moms. You guys have gotten caught, I know. I know you have. You've gotten caught comparing how smart your children are. You do that at school all the time. You get in these conversations about how smart wives compare how good their husbands are. And, and, and every wife in this room, if you're socially active, you've been around some wife who's just going over the top about how awesome her husband is. And inside, outside you're going, ah, right? Inside you're going, come on. <laughs> She's going on and on and on about how kind he is and how much of a revelation of God he's got. And he's even helping with the dishes and he's lining the chairs with daffodils and he walks behind me and says nice things all the time. And you're thinking, come on. <laughs> and your best story about your husband is he cut down to 14 beers a week. You're like, ah, what's going on? going on, man? My husband's from rural Australia. You're kidding me right now, right? right? So you, you, we do that. We do this with kids, especially if you have like a six, seven, or eight-year-old. You know what I'm talking about. You, you go to these second grade birthday parties and no one can drive themselves, so you have to drive yourself, and every parent in the room knows you hate it. You hate that stuff. You got to go hang out with the other moms and all you're going to do. And it becomes this huge one-upsmanship contest. Because all it takes is one mom bringing up a story about how smart her kid is. Right? And then once she says her story about how smart her seven-year-old is. And they're all phenoms, aren't they? Everybody thinks their kid is like the next Einstein or something. It's normally not true. They're normally just normal kids. But the, but the mom says this incredible, man, you wouldn't believe how fast Susie got through her math homework. Well, as soon as she says that, the next mom has to one-up that story. And then the next mom has to one-up that story. And then, then you got some mom going, you know what, I don't get this, but my seven-year-old, he figured out the other day the square root of two is an infinite number. I was amazed by that, right? right? I was amazed by that. And you're thinking, I don't have a story like that. I don't have a story like that. And then you're frantically looking around for your kid. And then you're looking around for your kid. And what you see is you see the one the one Chinese kid in the, in, in, on, in the corner over there solving some geometric equation, right? And so you're trying to find your kid and you look around and your kid is the one kid in the room with a bucket on his head beating his head against the wall, right? And you're like, oh no, no, stop beating your head against the wall. And someone says, who's the kid beating his head against the wall? Who's the bucket head kid over there? And you're like, I don't know who that kid is. And you find yourself disowning your own kid, kind of stuff happens. Once we determine what our kids are worth by looking at other people's kids, we cheapen the gift that God gave us. Because what about the couple that would do anything to have one kid? And they look at your kid with the bucket on his head and they go, man, I wish I had that. Sometimes we lose sight of what we do have at the altar of what we don't when we don't check these things in our life. Of course, there's spiritual envy as well. You know, why don't I see things they see in the Bible, leadership? How come everything they touch turns to gold? How come everything, how come, what, what is the deal? What, what is the deal with the guy at Hillsong? He could, he, he, could, he could show up in a city of 800 people and build a church of 2,000. What is going on with these people? What is going on? What kind of thing? Why didn't God put that on my life? Why, why, didn't, why didn't God put the kind of faith gift on my life that he gave Dr. Jerry Savelle? Why didn't he, why didn't he give me, why, why didn't he give me the ability to communicate like Joyce Meyer? Why didn't he give me Joel Osteen's hair? What's going on, you know? Like these guys, these guys, man, they, 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 these giants of the faith, man, why don't I see what they see? I think I'm just as good of a guy as they are. I think, see, if we're not careful, we look at everything they have without considering all the prices they pay, and we don't check envy at the door. Most, some of the most nastiest, violent, verbal attacks are all rooted in envy because we secretly or not so secretly want them to fail. Or uh, lifestyle. And, of course, TV does this, MTV Cribs. MTV Cribs is a TV show about showing you extraordinary things. So they'll show you Shaq's house. 
Shaq's got a 44-room house with a full gymnasium. He's got a 15-car garage. And here's what they subtly say. They say, maybe if you work hard enough, you can have a house like this. Let me let you in on something, okay? You're not 7'2". You're not 340 pounds. You don't have 12% body fat, and you don't have a 46-inch vertical leap. You're not Shaq. And if you start gauging the value of your life based on what exceptional people like that have, you're going to always be disappointed. And then envy doesn't get checked at the door. And before we know it, we we have given our whole life to the comparison trap. Um, Workplace, believing the myth that the next job will be envy than this one. You you, you talk about, you you ever heard someone talk about their work? I'm thinking about quitting my job. Why? People are so political there. Really? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go where human beings aren't present? <laughs> where, where are you going to go where there's no agendas? Where are you going to go? See, if you, the truth of it is, if you can't be happy, everything you need to do, everything God's called you to do is within your field and within your reach right now. And if you change fields, it doesn't help you at all. And if you destroy someone else's field, it doesn't make your field any more fruitful. And that's the problem with envy. Envy believes if they were off the face of the earth, my life would be better. And it's never true. Cain wipes Abel off the face of the earth. Did Cain's life get better? No. Saul tries to wipe David off the face of the earth. If he would have hit David with that javelin, does his life get better? No. What's true? David's now off the face of the earth. That's it. He still feels less than. It doesn't change. Envy allows us to believe that if someone else was wiped off the planet, somehow we would get what's in their field. But that's not how it works. It's just an absolute destructive sort of lie. Now, so what? So we live in 2016. Um, What do we do with this kind of information. What do we do about this to beat it? Let let me give you a couple of ideas here. One, envy is rooted in how you see yourself, never about what the other person has. It never never is about really them. Because if they happen, if those people died tomorrow, our life doesn't get any better. It's rooted in how we see ourselves. Do we really believe that our life has worth even if we don't get the promotion, the car, the shirt, the entrance to the club, the invitation there? See, the simplest gospel message is that you were loved while you were imperfect and before you realized the potentials of any of your life. That the whole gospel, the, the best gospel message is, is that God loved you before you were saved. If we want to use that word, God loves you after. God loves you during. But before you ever did one thing to reach the potential of your life, God called that out of you. He put everything in. He affirmed your worth. What one of the best gospel messages is, is that God does not treat people as they deserve. He always treats people how they're worth. Look at the flowers of the air. Look at the birds. They do nothing, but God feeds them and clothes them. God treats people as they are worth, not as they deserve. One of the best gospel messages and the most simplest form of the gospel message is that you are loved and you are valuable before you do anything at all. Do we really believe that? See, what happens is that the encounter with the other person scratches the belief that I'm less valuable without what they have. So we blame them. But even if they weren't here, we'd feel the same. It's not about them. So what do we do about it? A couple of ideas here. One, gratitude for what is present in your now will break the power of envy. The the, the best way to beat envy is not to fight envy. It's not to pray in the spirit until the spirit of envy leaves. No. The, 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 The best way to fight envy is not to fight envy. The best way to fight envy is to become fully conscious of God in your now, being so aware that God is here with you in every air that you breathe and begin to take account as to what's in your field without having to look left or right at all. And when we actually take account as to what's in our field, we, are, we could be amazed as what's in there. Let me just give you a few ideas. You were born in Australia. It's a pretty good one. You didn't ask for that, right? You didn't deserve that, right? You happen to live in one of the top four greatest nations on the earth, right? I, I, I find it funny when people complain about Australia. I travel the world. People complain about Australia. I'm like, where are you going to go? Like, honestly, if you can't make it in Australia, where are you going to go? You, you, you live in a nation where you could drive a motor car on a paved road to a store that prepares food for you. You want to go where? You could have been born in Kayasan, South Africa. Or worse, or worse you could have been born in South Sudan. Where if you just happen to be a wrong part of the wrong tribe, your life's in danger. Wait a minute, wait. When's the last time you took a second and you took a deep breath and said, wait a minute, I am so thankful for where I live. 
Not one person right now is worried about a warlord coming in here and opening fire. Not one. Not one. No one's scared about their safety going home tonight. No one. No one. Some houses in Australia have alarms, but very few. All, almost, all South, all, almost all Australian homes with alarms come from South Africans. <laughs> and I don't blame them. I don't blame them at all. I, I, I have an alarm on my house. But the truth of it is, is that in general, in Australia, you're safe. When's the last time we thought about that? Hey, when, when you want water tonight, you, you have a tap with relatively clean water in it. When's the last time we thought about that and actually expressed gratitude? And I don't think it's helpful for us to say we should, be, we should have gratitude attitude every moment of every day and, and then people go over the top and every breath they take, they're like, thank you, Jesus, thank you. Now, I don't think that's helpful at all. I think, having, I, think, I think having a general attitude where maybe five times a day we take 15 seconds because that's very doable. Five times a day, take 15 seconds and think about two things that are true in your now, regardless of right and left, and be genuinely thankful for what's there. Most of you can feel your toes hitting the ground. You know, there are people who can't. Most of us have all of our limbs. Most of us have both eyes that work. Yeah. Most of us. Most of us experience life in a fairly normally developed way. And even if we're at deficit in some place, you still live in Australia where there's good medical care. You know, we live in a nation with, uh, with electricity, clean water, machines that wash clothes, another machine that dries it, <laughs> a legal system that protects the weak against the strong. Like, this is a great place. Your life is great. It, if God allows you to live in Australia, what does he owe you for the rest of your life? I think he's good. In, in other words, if all you did, if all, if, if, if all God said, you know what, all I did for you your whole life was I allowed you to live in a free country, what else does he owe you? God is now an infinite credit. Your field is full. We have running water, electricity, great friends, family that loves us. We're healthy. We can feel our feet on the ground. We have breath which isn't something to take lightly. I remember there, uh, this one moment 23 years ago really marked me. I was in uh, college, and I met a man named Richard Wormbrand. Richard Wormbrand's dead now, but Richard Wormbrand was a follower of Jesus in Romania before it was legal. And so what the communists did to Richard Wormbrand is they tortured him until he recanted Jesus. Here's the problem. He never recanted Jesus. So when I... When I met Richard Wormbrand, he could not walk. His feet were like size 22, even though they started at size 10 because of the swelling that was infinitely there from the beatings on the bottoms of his feet. To get, uh, to, to get him to recant Jesus, they took his wife and threw her in the Rhine River, which was three degrees Celsius at the time. They'd throw her in the river, and then they'd fish her out with a pole, and then they'd stand her in front of him shivering, and they'd say, you deny Jesus. And she'd say, please don't deny Jesus. And they'd throw her back in, and then they'd fish her out with the pole, and then they'd stand her in front of him and say, you deny Jesus. And he says, I'm not going to deny Jesus. And she's saying, please don't deny Jesus. And they'd throw her again again, and then they'd beat him. And here's what Richard Warren was famous for in Romania. And this is why the church in Romania is as strong as it can be. And I'm so excited. Um, in, in June, I'm getting to do a huge conference in Romania with a, with a church there that is just thriving. They've got over 10,000 people, and, and they're thriving in this new reality in Romania. But part of the reason it's a new reality in Romania was there was a man who, even in the beatings, was willing to look at the guards and say, I forgive you, and I affirm the Spirit of Christ's love for you. I forgive you, and I affirm the Spirit of Christ's love for you. And one by one by one, he led them all to to Jesus. Why? Because he told them they were wrong? No. Because he cast the devil out of them? No. He won them with kindness and love. And you know what? There's people going through things like that all over this world. Your life is good. Amen. Gratitude. Gratitude. Number, number four, practicing kindness. The basic do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus says that's the summation of things. See, if you were to give me a list of your negative traits or mistakes, you wouldn't want me using that to draw all my conclusions about you. Like if you had this real honest moment, you said, listen, here's the deal. Here's a list of all the mistakes I can think of I ever made in my life. You won't want me to take that list and then draw all my conclusions about you. And if you wouldn't want me to do that about you, then we shouldn't do that about anybody else. But you know what rationalizes that? Envy. When we look at someone's life and we get envious of what they have, when we find one mistake and we can use that to draw conclusions about their whole life, the only time people do that is if there's envy present because only envy rationalizes such crazy things. 
practicing present gratitude and practicing present kindness. Doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. It breaks the power of envy in our life. Last thought is this. If envy is a practice of the heart, and it is, envy resides in the heart. It's practiced there. It's molded there. It's imagined there. It's built there. Envy is a practice of the heart, then so is the solution. Practicing kindness and gratitude in the secret place of our imagination can set us free from envy. Regularly setting aside a time. And this is why I, I don't want to get too over the top with this. I don't want to go, we should just, every time something good happens, you should be, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. You should be walking through the grocery store, praying in the spirit because there's groceries. No, no, no. I, I just don't think that's helpful. And quite frankly, it's weird, right? If you're praying in the spirit in the grocery store loudly, I, stop, okay? But, but, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's what is helpful. And here's what is doable. Regularly setting aside one-minute intervals during the day, maybe. Maybe five one-minute intervals. That's five minutes a day at one minute at a time. And stopping and breathing and asking yourself this question, what would I feel like, Lord, if your presence was in me now? What would I feel like, Lord, if I knew that you were with me? And then just begin to be utterly thankful and, and, and show gratitude for what's in your field now without looking right or left, past or present, past or future. Right now. And then begin in your imagination to practice kindness. One of the things I do every day in my life, every day, is I take a couple minutes a day and I imagine the kindness and compassion of God coming out of me. I imagine that all around me. Because here's what I know. As many people as I meet in a week, I'll never remember all their names. I'll never be right every time. You can't speak as much as I speak and not be wrong about something. It's impossible. I, I don't want to be known for my rightness. Because that's an unwinnable battle. What I want to be known as is when people encountered me, that they felt better about themselves when they left my presence than when they entered it. Because the Spirit of God touched them with kindness. And you know where you could build that? In the secret place of your imagination. Jesus said it this way. My Father who's in the air that I breathe, I stop and become aware of you. He said when you do that in your secret place, become aware of the Father's presence. In John 17, he said it this way. Father, I've manifested your name. I've manifested your name to everybody in public. Why? Because when he hallows it in secret, he manifests it in public. And here's the truth of it. Whatever you hallow in secret, you will manifest in public. If you hallow and you build envy and jealousy and you don't check those things and in that secret place in your heart, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Trust me, at some point, it's going to manifest in public as violence. But there's an answer for that. And if you can build envy in the imagination of your heart till it comes out as violence here, then you can build gratitude and kindness in the imagination of your heart and it will manifest in public. What you hallow in secret, you will manifest in public. May we be people who hallow the kindness of God Amen. and be set free from envy. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you and we honor you. We proclaim your king. Why don't you just right now, let's just be quiet before the Lord and let's take a deep breath. And I want you to ask this question, Lord, what would I feel like if your presence was here now? If I could feel you, what would that feel like? And then with the consciousness of God around you, I just want you to take 15 seconds and underneath your breath, I want you to begin to tell him what you're thankful for. Lord, I'm thankful for the free country I live in. I'm thankful for my health. I'm I'm so thankful that I can feel my feet on the floor. I'm thankful for a vocal cords that are strong and work. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for safety. I'm thankful for laws that protect us. I'm thankful for guardrails that don't let us go too far off course. All of these things are in our field right now. We don't have to look right, left, past, or future. They're right there. Just take a second and begin to say that. Now, what I want us to do is I want you to picture the kindness of God and ask yourself this question, what would you feel like if that kindness flooded your being and began to go off of you to other people? What would it be like in the supermarket if they could feel the kindness of God in your presence? What would it be like if we could build that atmosphere around us? Can you imagine a world without envy? Can you imagine a world where we were content being kind to our neighbor? 
Lord, would you do that in us? Amen. Amen. Look this way. Thanks so much for letting me be a part of your life tonight and, and be a part of your week. I really enjoy it. I hope you got a lot out of that. That's a brand new one. I've never done that before. I hope that'll work. All right? Um, I hope that speaks right to where we are and is very applicable. Um, if you're here tonight and you've never received what Jesus did for you before the foundation of the world, I hope you would do that tonight before you leave. If you need something to say, you could simply say something like this. Lord Jesus, I'm going to choose to put my trust in your version of my story instead of my own. The story I've written for myself, I believe that your version is better. And I would love to put my trust in that version of my story instead of mine. I'd love to be a part of what you're doing. You could do that. Um, I'd love to be a part of your life more often than I can. We're very, very, very booked up. And so thank you for being low-maintenance friends. Thanks for being a part of my life. I can't wait to see you in a year's time. I love you all very much. May you be winners and be set free from the thing crouching at the door. Grace and peace. God bless. Well, awesome. We've had an awesome time. Blessed of the Lord, aren't we? Blessed, blessed, blessed. Thank you, my brother. Are you going to go straight out? Come stand. Let's, let's all pray for you. Going on. And uh, he's doing a, yeah, booked up every week. Father, we just thank you right now as we mix our faith and our love with Shane and his team as he goes from here. We are so grateful for the impartation that he has brought to us, revelation knowledge that has caused us to be better and greater and have more understanding of you and your word. But more importantly, it's drawing us closer to you, Lord, in intimacy and to see your kindness flowing through him and us as we will be the kindest church in the place. We will exhibit those, those elements that you want us to, that people will come in and be loved. And as he goes forward, Lord, we just stretch your faith out and we say anointing, increase, increase, increase. Lord, may your God protect him, may every need be met, and may he speak as the oracles of God. And we give you praise for him and his team and that which is meant to us, Lord. Bless him as he goes. And we thank you. We will see him again over this next year. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. 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 Awesome shame. So please go and have some fellowship. Go and uh, buy and then speak. Go buy and then chat or whatever. And then we'll see you all on Sunday morning. God bless everyone. Still believe